Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, so much thanks, for the gift of salvation that we have in Jesus. It is so unbelievable that despite our sinfulness, you loved us and sent Jesus to die on the cross, and that now we are fully justified in your sight. Help us as we are people who live in the world but not of the world to be sustained in that tension by your gracious gifts of word and sacrament, as well as the ever-abiding presence of your Holy Spirit. And be with us as you send us out. Help us to recognize opportunities for those that you place in our path to share the wondrous news of the gospel with them so that they too will be free from the ensnaring of this world. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Second article of the Apostles' Creed is what we're covering today. And I know a couple of people have asked really, uh, really in-depth questions about the nature of what happens after we die. And is that, is that you know, the thief on the cross uh, today will be with me in paradise, or is that they're going to be resurrected on the coming of the day of the Lord? Right. Um, so we're going to be talking about that next week. So I just want to drop a little teaser for you, uh, which I think will be our last class before the summer. So next week will be our last class before taking a break from our classes for the summer. As I understand this tradition here. So um, if you guys get really rapid and you want to have something after just taking a week, and you're just like, oh, we can't stand it. You got to have a Bible class. I'm happy to provide it. Um, but uh, we'll talk about that next week. All right, so the second article, part one, if you want to open up your catechisms to page 164. And if you have a Bible present, you can open it to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we're going to look at verses 24 to 29 to kick off our discussion today. All right, so we talked about that the, each article in the creed is about a person of the Trinity, and it has a main concept. So for the second article, who's the person of the Trinity? The Son, right? Jesus Christ. And we have a very specific confession about him. That's the long paragraph, right? We're not just saying he's the Son of God, but we're describing in detail in our confession of faith all the things that he's done as the Son of God, right? And if we would summarize in one word what it's about, the first one was about creation. What is the second article about? Redemption. Redemption. Very good. Redemption. Right? Essentially, we're reading all of the details of God's plan of salvation and Jesus to redeem us from our sin. All right. Does everybody turn to John chapter 20 in their Bibles? I don't know if this music stand is going to hold this gigantic study Bible, but we'll test it out here. So John chapter 20, we're starting at verse 24. Does somebody want to read that for us? Sure. Now Thomas, is there one there? Yeah. All right. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. All right, so we're going we're gonna to look at what Thomas's confession is here, but before we do that, I want us to read together the second article, so it'll be in bold, either on the top of your outline or on the top of page 164 in your catechism. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
be a sign of the heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And under what does this mean? We're just going to read the first uh, paragraph here. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ is the true God, the God of the Father from eternity, and also a true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. All right. So that's what we're going to be focusing on as part of the explanation today. And we may get into the second paragraph as well, depending on how many penetrative questions you guys ask. All right. So hopping back into John chapter 20, forget what we just read there. What is Thomas's confession about Jesus in John chapter 20? This is a famous doubting Thomas is what it's been historically called, but it's more accurately described as not doubting, but disbelieving Thomas. He didn't doubt that the disciples saw Jesus. He said, I don't believe it. Okay, so what's his initial confession about Jesus? That's his eventual, what's his initial connection? Or his initial confession? All right. So he says he doesn't believe that the disciples saw Jesus, which means he believes what about Jesus? That he's dead, which then means that he's what? Or he's not what? He's not God. He's not the Messiah. Right? Thomas is still in the frame of mind that everything is lost, everything is over, Jesus is dead and gone. Right? Now, Jesus, in his great mercy, right, could easily have said, well, I've given Thomas plenty of reasons to believe who I am. There's no reason that I, the Son of God, need to appear before him to assuage his disbelief. But in his great mercy, that's exactly what he does. Right? So he shows himself to Thomas and he says, here, do all the things that you demanded of God in order to believe. And then what is Thomas's confession? My Lord and my God. Okay? And that's really important. My Lord and my God. Right? Because what could the Messiah supposedly be? Huh? Well, we'll get there. Prophet. Some of them thought he was a prophet, maybe. Yeah, he was just a prophet or a great teacher or a wise person, right? But that's not really what Jesus is, is it? Right? And C.S. Lewis has this great line. I think it's in Mere Christianity where he says that Jesus does not afford you that option. If you look at what he teaches, right? Either Jesus is the Son of God or he's a crazy person. There's really no in-between because everything that he says is based on that truth. If he's the Son of God, then he's able to say what he says. If he's not, he's just a crazy person who thinks he's the Son of God. Right? And so when Thomas makes this confession, it is a good confession. It's not just saying, my Lord, as in you're an earthly uh, figure that I admire. He says, my Lord and my God, right? Presumably because he's in awe that somebody you saw die is now alive, right? And that's not something normal humans do. Yeah, yeah Ross had said that uh, Jesus either had to be a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Yeah, that's good. I, I was trying to remember that. The, the alliteration is nice. So Rob pointed out that the way a lot of people express what Lewis was saying is that he's the three L's. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. There's no in between anywhere. Right? Um, and that's really important because even, even growing up in a pastor's house, that the, the statements about, well, Jesus isn't the Son of God, he's a prophet, like they say in Islam, right? He's, a, he's just a prophet, he's another one of the prophets. Or, or in, in the yogic traditions, They'll say that he's a wise teacher. He's known for being a wise teacher. And, on the, and, and if you just like hear those things, you think, oh, that makes sense, right? You're, if you don't think he's God, you're probably not going to be like saying he's just an insignificant person that doesn't matter at all. You'll probably say, well, he's, you know, he's a wise prophet, a wise teacher, etc. Okay? And when I heard that for the first time, that that's not possible, and then you hear what Jesus says, right? Look. I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's not something a prophet says. Okay. And that's the sort of statement that it's either true or it's not. 
right? He doesn't leave himself purposely any wiggle room there. That'd be like saying, I am the best at tennis. That's either true or it's not true, right? I either am or I'm a liar. In this case, I'm a liar, right? <laughs> so Jesus does not leave us that option. So letter B there under number Roman numeral two there. The two natures of Christ are true man and true God. True man and true God. Now you might be used to hearing that, but imagine hearing somebody claim that for the first time. And that's what Peter does on Pentecost when he preaches Jesus. He says, this Jesus whom you killed, whom you crucified, is the Son of God. Right? He's no mere man. Right? Um, and so we're going to look at, as we go through the, the, the creed here, that those are both absolutely essential to the way God achieves salvation in Jesus for mankind. Right? Um, that he had to be both true God and true man. Yeah, wrong. It's, it's also crucial that it's 100% God and 100% man, which is beyond our understanding. Yes. So typically when you say true God and true man, you don't mean that he split down the middle and he's 50% man or 50% God. He's 100% of both. Right? So he's fully human and fully divine at the same time. Now, if you know any church history, this teaching of the church by itself was like the major controversy for the next millennia, basically. And every early church heresy was centered around explaining how Jesus was true God and true man or disagreeing with him. So there were people that would posit that he was just a man who became adopted into the Godhead by living a perfect life. Um, by the grace of God, he was allowed to do that. Uh, there are people that would say that he's like Zeus, the stories of Zeus, that he never gave up his divinity, but he just took on the form of a man. Um, now, what part of the confession we just made in the second article would dispute that claim? That he was just pretending to be a man, just taking on the form of a man. He suffered, crucified, died, and was buried. Yeah, suffered, crucified, died, and was buried. But he didn't just pretend all that stuff. He actually died. And if we're, in order for him to die, he would have to be what? Human. Okay. All right, now we're going to look at what, what look at some of the things, what it means to confess that Jesus is true God. So we're going to look at true God first. All right, so open up to John chapter 1. The famous tongue twister. <laughs> All right, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'll read it for us here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All right. So, um, and then will somebody look up the 1 Corinthians 8, 6? And read that one for us. All right, go ahead, Trish. Um, yep, for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we exist. And there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we exist. Okay, so. What do these verses tell us about Jesus' divine nature? He rules over everything. Okay, so he rules over everything. What about in John? Where does it tell us? Uh, so one of the theories about Jesus is that he's a regular man who became God. What does John chapter 1 have to say about that? He always was. He always was, right? In the beginning, Jesus was present there as the pre-incarnate word, right? So any. So Jesus is described as the Word made flesh here later in John, chapter 1. So the Word in reference here at the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
That word is Jesus. Okay. So he can't have been a regular person that became God, right? Because he's been God since the beginning. What about 1 Corinthians 8, 6? What does that one tell us about God's, the divine nature of Jesus? It's still monotheism, right? There's still one God. Yeah. What, what textual technique is used there that helps you understand that that is the case? You have to teach you some hermeneutical terms today. Yeah. Well, I may not have the right term, but they define the Father, then they define church, Jesus, and the definition is exactly the same. Yes. So those are parallel statements. All right. So the parallel statement made there in 1 Corinthians 8 6 is the same for the description of the Father and the Son, which means that they're co equal in terms of divinity. Right. Now, of course, you get into some snags and snares here because the Trinity is beyond our capability to understand. But the language being used here, and, and it, actually the gospel reading today is a good example as well. Right? Jesus is not praying like we would pray. Right? If you read the high priestly prayer, he's not talking as one at the mercy of God. He's talking as one co-equal with God. And so when we hear the request that Jesus makes in the high priestly prayer, for example, it isn't him asking the Father for something. It's him proclaiming what the Father is going to do, essentially. Right. All right, so Jesus being true God, go to the top of the next page on the handout. Was Jesus made or created? No, right? Yeah, okay, so we're going to get to that thing. Right? He's not made or created. What word do we use, Cooper? Begotten. We say that he was begotten of the Father. And then the phrase after that is before all things were made, right? Which is a, a way of saying, like, he's sort of like one of the theories that people will say is like that it's just like a, a continual state. The person of Jesus is begotten of the Father. Like constantly, and the Spirit is also being poured out from from the Trinity constantly. But, yeah. um, Jesus, the one hundred percent man, was begotten, but Jesus, the one hundred percent God, was once. Correct. So we understand that the person of Jesus in the Trinity is begotten of the Father. So when he like, so the the nature of that relationship does alter. When he when he does become incarnate, because then he does remember we're saying he's not playing at being human; he really becomes human. Mm -hmm. And so, in doing so, he subjects himself to the other persons of the Trinity. In that sense. Well, yeah. So I guess that begs the question: the begotten in the creed isn't a reference to his human birth. I, I thought that was. Do we interpret that as the human begotten or as like an eternal begotten at the beginning? I think it's both. Um, so, and this is where the Trinity stuff gets confusing because in the person of the Trinity, Jesus is begotten of the Father. Uh, in, in our minds, we always try to say that that then means that he's somehow like on a lower level of Godhood than the Father. Right? Uh, that's only true with relative, relative to his humanity. Relative to divinity, it's never true, but it's still described as begotten. Right? Um, but that's you know that's where we get into also like you look at this our statements about communion is like in with and under and around and through and, you know above and below like we're just trying to illustrate something with words that are too limited to to be able to illustrate because we can't really grasp the relationship there. Um, okay, now turn to page 172 in your, your catechism. So this is a key question here, and that is, why is this necessary for God's plan of salvation? So we're, and we're still on the true God part. So why is it necessary? Oh, here we go. So if, if you want to actually turn to page 167, we have a question particularly about the thing we were just talking about. 
Question 152. What does it mean to confess that Jesus is the God of the Father from eternity? So the Son has no beginning. He eternally receives life from the Father. Thus, in the Nicene Creed, we forget to speak, confess Jesus as begotten, not made. Right? So the reference there is to John 1 and then Hebrews 1 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Right. So that's the word that we that is used to describe the relationship between the person of the Father and the person of the Son of the Trinity from eternity. Now it does alter slightly when he becomes incarnate. Because then he's no longer just true God, but also true. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So as much as that question is going to be answered, that's pretty much what it is. I seem to skip a couple of things on Alpha that I want to talk about. So we'll look at the catechism here. Uh, what do we call the events by which the Son of God became man? Well, that's the celebration. But what do we call the reality that God became man? Huh? Immaculate conception. Okay, immaculate conception. That's the birth. But the reality of him becoming man is incarnation. Right? And that word is like carnus is flesh. So he is becoming in flesh, literally, is what that means. Right? Um, and that's to dis that's to distinguish it from the other pagan um, religious theories that would talk about God's taking on the forms of men. That Jesus is not taking on the form, of, right? Um, so in any story where uh, most of the stories, I'm not aware of anywhere that talk about at least among the Greek pantheon of uh, them being born, they're always just there taking on the form of whatever they're taking on the form of, whether it's an animal or a person. Um, so Jesus becomes in flesh, specifically in flesh in the exact same way that you and I are doing. Right? He becomes a baby in the womb of a human woman and is born. Right? So he's becoming in flesh. How did that take place? We're on top of page 169 in the Catechism. How did the incarnation take place? The Holy Spirit fashioned from Mary a true human body and soul for the Son of God. Right. So we're not, not play acting here, fully gets a body and a soul. Okay. Uh, Luke 1 35, the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. And that was, of course, prophesied back in Isaiah as well. That the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, you shall call his name Emmanuel. So what can we say about Jesus as a result of his incarnation? That not only did it change the relationship with the Father, but it also changed the relationship with us. What did that make us? Brothers. Brothers. Right? Fellow sons of God. So actually, like we say child of God a lot because it's a gender neutral way of describing it. But actually, the biblical way you would express what our new relationship with God is for male and female would be to describe us as sons of God. And the reason we would say that is because the sons are those who receive the inheritance. Right? And so what, <clears throat> what's happening in Jesus is it isn't just the male children who are receiving the inheritance, but all of them. Right? And in the ancient world, that was expressed through sons of God because the sons had received inheritance from the father. So we say child of God, but it's sons of God, right? And therefore, now we are fellow sons of God with Jesus, which is pretty cool. To, to note on that, yeah. we're, we're very gender sensitive in this nation because our language isn't gender sensitive. In almost every language that's gender sensitive, um, every noun is either male or female. However, if it's pluralized, it's always meant. So, in, in this sense, since it's pluralized, it's all inclusive, it's male. And, and that doesn't mean manhood, it means personhood. Yeah. 
And specifically in terms of the promise being described as an inheritance, there is the other layer there of meaning, but it is referring to son specifically in the sense of that is the inheritor, right? And so you're included in that in that phrase intentionally, right? It's not just males, but males and females are the inheritors of God through Jesus. Right? Um, or we sometimes express that is that he gave us, he exchanged our relationship with the father with his, right? So before we were dead in our trespasses and sins and enemies of God, Jesus took that relationship upon the cross and then in, in exchange gave us his as the son of God, right? uh, inheritor of God. Hebrews 2.11, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. And we had a reading of the, uh, to that effect, I think, two weeks ago, right? He said, I no longer call you servants, right? For the servants don't know what the master is thinking. Um, so Jesus becomes incarnate, then he becomes our brother, which means he shares everything with us apart from our sin. That he has human ancestry. Right, if you read uh, the beginning of Matthew, you can do that whole genealogy there. He has a human body and soul. He has a human sex. So we believe you know, Jesus was a male, right? He's described as a male. And the only sort of characteristics of, of sex that we apply to God are things that he ascribes to himself. Right? So no, nobody came up with the Father. Right, that's something God, a title God, gave Himself. So that's what we say. Because you'll you'll see there are times where people want to say uh, father and mother because they want to like include everyone, or they feel slighted by God identifying Himself as Father or whatever that is. Um, but this goes back also to like the teachings that the church has historically on order of creation, right? Um, the like Adam is made first. And part of his role is meant to be to lead Eve, but by lead, leading her in the sense of serving her in the same way that Christ serves the church. Right? So, like, it's always fun when you get to Ephesians 5 and premarital counseling, because it has the S word in there, and you have to deal with that because it's the word of God in the Bible. Right? And one of the best examples I've heard of that is uh, I have a Bible study um, resource, and he described, he said, Ladies, if you went home today and your husband said this to you, would you be on board with the mission, submission to what his leadership entails, which is, honey, I realize that I haven't been taking a spiritual leadership role in our family and taking serious intent with our children faith-wise, and I'd like to change that. I'd like to read the Bible with our kids and set time aside each day to do that. I'd like to go to Bible class and start learning about things at church so I can teach my kids those things. Will you help me do that? And then he asks, how many of you ladies would be on board with that? And like everybody raised their hand, right? And what he was doing there is he was helping them understand that submission in the context of Ephesians 5 and this maleness that's described for God the Father is meant to be understood only through Jesus, not our world and the way we always twist that stuff up. Right, which is one of the reasons the Trinity is so hard for us because we're just so, always so tempted to be like, all right, but yeah, who's in charge? Who's the one up here and the one down here and the one down here? Right, and God's like, that's not how it works. Right, and the same with Jesus. I have all the authority in heaven and on earth, and I'm going to go die on the cross. What? Right. Um, for me, that's a great comfort because that means there's no way that that plan was devised by a human person. Because it's not a plan a human would have ever come up with or actually. So just a little aside there. But that <clears throat> so Jesus is identified as a male, right? And his humanity. And he has human needs and feelings, right? So what's a time where Jesus shows some feelings, some human feelings? Beat on the cross. Beat on the cross. Lazarus. 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 Yeah, Lazarus, right? He cries, right? Where else? Uh, his righteous anger in the temple. Okay, yeah, when he's upset about the way the temple's being being abused. Gethsemane. Gethsemane. When he's praying in Gethsemane, right? I was going to say when he sweated blood, so yeah. yeah. There you go, right? 
There's another one too when he's out in the wilderness. What is what what need arises? What human need arises? Hunger. He's hungry, right? So there's specific references to these things that are basically, I mean, like he's he's God, so he could have just made bread appear in his stomach already digested in his body, and nobody would have known. Not even the devil, right? But it doesn't do that, right? It specifically makes reference to his humanity over and over and over again in a complete sense. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Question 159 on page 171. Why is it so important for us as sinners that the Son of God has become our brother? So as our brother, Jesus fulfilled our obligation to keep the law. Okay. So what good would it have done for God to keep his own law in order to atone for humans not keeping his law? Nothing. A human had to do it in order to become a worthy sacrifice once for all. So Jesus becomes human and lives the sinless life, keeps the law perfectly on our behalf, right? We call that his active obedience. So Galatians 4, 5, uh, 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So that's another example again where we realize that Jesus is not playing a human, right? He's born under his own law. Which means that if he did not keep that law, he would be guilty of sin just like anyone else, right? Um, by virtue of authority. And then Jesus suffered and died to pay the penalty of our sin. That's his passive obedience. He's, so there's constant reference in the Gospels where Jesus is submitting himself to the will of the Father. So one example that's brought up was the prayer in Gethsemane, right? Where he says, if there's another way, let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, but as you will. Yeah, right. One interesting thing about all of this, this was the first time that God the Father uh, saw and experienced what, you know, the, the pain of, you know, death was like, and, and the sadness, and so much that Jesus was experiencing as a human, God didn't put the mother's foot because he's God. So God the Father, through Jesus' uh, existence of a, as a human, was experiencing things new to him. At least I think that's the case. Well, we're, I mean, we wouldn't get too much into that. I mean, that's pretty speculative because part of being God is that anything you can do, anything. So, like being able to have the genuine experience of a human without being a human would be under that moniker. Um, so, that could be the case, but we don't really have enough scriptural evidence to state stuff like that. Um, if God is all-knowing, then yeah, he would know. Right. <laughs> he experience it. No, but he knows. And that's where things start to get dicey because you're also talking about, like, we're creatures within time. So what does it mean that he has not yet experienced that? Because uh, he's a being outside of time. Um, and then then your brain melts and flows out of your ears. And you're just like, <laughs> you know, it's like Indiana Jones. Uh, uh, yeah, Ron. What does it mean, born under the law? Yeah, so uh, the phrase born under the law means that he subjected himself to the law. So not only was he born fully human, but he, so like God does not have to abide by his own law. The law he gave was his law for us. What do you mean by the law? In the Old Testament? Or what? Yeah, the, the moral law that he gave to his people. So the, the covenant, the original covenant that God makes with Israel, which Israel repeatedly fails to keep, right? Jesus is the one who is the perfect Israel, who keeps the covenant of Israel in our place so that we receive the benefits of that fulfilled covenant. Right? Um, that's a good question, right? And, and it's an essential part to understand about Jesus. Um, like not only is it support that he's not playing at being human, he is becoming human but that he subjects himself to the laws that God gave to humanity. Yeah, that's why Mary had said to what, uh, Jesus' siblings, why can't you be more like your big brother? <laughs> yeah, that would have been hard to live up to. Uh, all right. Um, yeah. 
I'm not sure I understand um, where it's, it's number 495B and it says Jesus suffered and died and it says this was his passive obedience. Why is that yeah. passive? I mean, he he actively did that. He could have, wouldn't he have refused? He didn't actively do that. The okay. way that Jesus ended up on the cross was by not doing it. Like a lamb before a shears, he was silent. Right, so when he's at every point during the passion, he could have stopped everything he wanted to. Right? When he's betrayed, when he's arrested, when he's brought on trial, and mm -hmm. when there are false witnesses brought against him. Right? So the reason that he doesn't, he passively obeys, right? So when something's passive, it means that something is being done to you, mm -hmm. right? And so God's plan of salvation, you could say, is being done to Jesus. And he subjected himself to that. Right, so that's what he sort of does. He sets his face on that when he uh, before he gets to Gethsemane, but that's really where we we hear it verbalized when he prays, and he, you can tell that he's anxious about what must be done, so he knows what's coming, but then he intentionally subjects himself to the will of the Father. He says, "Not by my will, but Your will be done." Okay. Right, and so that's why we would say that's his passive obedience. <clears throat> I was going to see if there was one of those people that gave the country a bit up, but they're all pretty much the same. And then letter C on the top of page 172, Jesus overcame death so that we too can be raised from death. Right, so the, the first fruits of the new creation is Jesus. First Corinthians 15, 20, right? But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. All right, so why is it necessary for God's plan of salvation that Jesus is true God? Given what we discussed. What's, what's a part of that plan that can only be carried out by God? Perfect adherence to the law. Okay, perfect adherence to the law. I don't think any other human in the world would have been able to take on all of the sin of the world without blowing up. All right, yeah. Let's take on the sins of the whole world. There's one other big one. He couldn't have the um, original sin. <laughs> Very good. Had to have been untainted by original sin. So the Savior. So what's? Well, this is a. Get to talk a little philosophy. Okay. What's the difference between a Savior and a teacher? The teacher's just talking, right? I mean, it's not. It's not acting. On behalf of right? the teacher, say, can I would almost say that um, <laughs> teacher is almost of this world, whereas like a savior is of you know a higher authority, kind of beyond okay um, this world. So there's sort of a, a, a difference in proximity, right? Right. Um, yeah, um, Pete. Uh, let's use the example of an EMT. You could train someone to be an EMT. What does that make you an EMT? An EMT can save a person's life. It doesn't really isn't really teaching you how to do it to yourself. You're getting close. Okay. You're getting close. So it has to do where truth lies. So think about with the teacher, where is truth? It's it's internal. Yeah. Right? Because what is the teacher's job? Teach truth. To teach the truth, to reveal the truth to you. The truth is already there, right? They're not, they're not bringing you the truth. They're teaching it to you. Right? With the Savior, where is the truth? He is the truth. He is the truth right? So they say like our salvation came extra nos is the Latin phrase, from outside of ourselves. Right? So a Savior means, and, and Kierkegaard talks about this quite a bit, it's if you need a savior, that means that you are hopelessly entrapped. That truth does not reside within you or within the world you occupy. 
And so by definition, the teacher does not help, is insufficient. Right? The Savior is not, because the Savior brings truth. They're not teaching you truth. They are the truth coming to you. Right? Um, and so the fact that Jesus is true God means that he is coming from outside of the broken and corrupted creation, to redeem it, which is necessary in order to keep the law. Right? Very good. All right. What does it mean to confess that Jesus is true man? We're kind of hopping back and forth here a little bit. So this covers some of the stuff we talked about. So let's look at Hebrews 4, 15 and 1 Timothy 2, 5, which I think should be on page 167 in your catechism as scripture references. Yeah, the very bottom there. So Hebrews 4, 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Okay. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So what does it mean to confess that Jesus is true man? Can a God sympathize with your weakness? A God can. A God does not have weakness. What has weakness? Man. Right? So God's compassion is born out in his incarnation. Right? And he's been tempted in every way that you and I have. Every way that you and I have. Yet, without sin. Okay, so there was that understanding and compassion component and he had to fulfill the law which part of that is being subjected to the temptation to break it right then in first Timothy 2 5 and 6 you know Jesus could always he always knew what the Pharisees or whatever were thinking so that's that's God in him doing that Sure. The human couldn't know that, right? Yep. Right. So I don't know what my point is. But... <laughs> no, no, I mean, so we would say, we would say that like, did Jesus always know what they were thinking? Maybe, maybe not, because he could have chosen to not know, right? So we do know that he knew what they were thinking when it specifically tells us that that he knew the thoughts of their hearts. Um, but that, again, is where you get into the mystery of being true God and true man, right? That um, to what degree, because there are times where it, Jesus is totally leaving his divine nature untouched or left behind, right? When he, when he subjects himself to death on a cross, for example. But then there are also times where he picks it up, like in the transfiguration, or when he's able to do things like that or bring people back from the dead and all that sort of stuff, right? But, I, I yes. Yeah. Um, love the portraits of, of Christ when they had to wake him up because it showed you just how tired he was and, 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 and how much he was working beforehand that he had to fall asleep because being true God he could have made himself feel rested without sleeping sure yeah but he worked so hard for us in his in his mission that he was just plumb tuckered half the time around his, 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 his disciples. But then, right before he's going to be crucified, he's asking his disciples to stay awake and they can't. And I always, I always thought that was a, a unique vision of his humanity. Yeah, no, yeah, and, and I think the Bible is very intentional about pointing those things out. So he brought up that, like, there, he loves the pictures of when Jesus has to be woken from sleep. That, and that, those are more and more specific examples given demonstrating that he's not play acting at being human, but is in fact human. Um, in 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, the thing that's being pointed out here is there are two, there are two people in this relationship between us and God. There's God and men, and there needs to be someone in between. Right? So if you have a if you have a 
like irreconcilable relationship with somebody, what's the only way that that's going to be mended? Third party. It's a third party, right? Somebody's going to come in and mediate on your behalf. Because if it's irreconcilable, that means you're not going to hear anything they have to say, and they're not going to hear anything you have to say. Right? And that's what our relationship with God was before Jesus came into the picture, right? The Bible describes us not merely as like disobedient, but active enemies, active opponents of God. Um, all right. How does the incarnation work? So we talked about that and what changed as a result of the incarnation is that Jesus became our brother. So now the question is, why is it necessary for Jesus to be true man in God's plan of salvation? What are the parts of God's plan of salvation that require a human? Son of David. So the son of David, so fulfilling his prophecies that he was coming from the line of a human family. So he could, he had to act like a man, so we would know what he's going through. Like whatever. What do you explain that a little bit? What do you mean? Like if he felt pain, we feel pain in the same way. I mean, he feels our pain by becoming a human, like in the sense that he experiences the pain of being human. He doesn't experience, like, well, I guess you could say he does experience Ron Persio's pain because he took your sins upon himself on the cross. But that's not really what we're getting at. It's related to what we're doing. Redemption buying back. Okay, buying back. Right? What do you have to do? What do you need to buy back something? Right. What do you need to buy back something? You had to be able to die. You need, you need some form of payment, right? Right? And what's the payment in this case for the buying back? Is death. Death. Can God die? No. Right? Who can die? A man. Right? If we're not adopted brothers in Christ, we will never be adopted sons to the Father. Yeah, um, right. So, I, I mean, if if Jesus came down only as a deity, where would our relationship be? By Jesus coming down as a man, we have a human bond with okay. him as well. Very good. You guys are kind of dancing around it. You got, you got it. I think right there. That, like, who did, G who was Jesus sent to redeem? Was he sent to redeem sons of God? Sinners. Sinners. And sinners are humans, right? So Jesus was sent to redeem humanity, and in order to do that, he had to become a human to pay the price on our behalf. He can't pay the price on our behalf as the Son of God. Because the Son of God's out there, which is in this case just him, don't need redeeming. The humans do. So in order to pay the price that human humanity required for redemption, he had to become human fully. Especially considering that he knew that none of us were going to be able to do that. Right? Um, so the humanity is required for the death. For the fulfilling of the law, because you have to be under the law to fulfill it, and for the redemption of the creatures known as humans. Right? And we like to, especially in the Western world, we believe that our faith is very cerebral and, and highbrow, but really the Bible is a very visceral thing. And so the price required for the redemption of the creatures known as humans was a bloody death. Because while God is love, he's also just, which means the price had to be paid for the sin. Right? It was a violation of the created order of God that had to be addressed. Yeah, Jim. God's plan of salvation was for us to believe in Jesus and we receive salvation. Right? Yeah. So everybody that died before Jesus was born 
what happened? Were they part of that plan? Yes, that's a great question. So the question was, if if salvation is 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 ours by believing in Jesus, what happened about the people who died before Jesus showed up? So in the uh, Paul gives us a good example of this with Abraham. Why was Abraham's faith counted as righteous? Faith. He did God's will. He believed. He believed. And what did he believe? What did he have faith in? The promises of God. Right? He had faith in God's word. Right? And what is Jesus? God's word. Right? And so the same faith that saves Abraham and Moses and Joseph and all those people is the same faith that saves you. So I, I have the image, if you want to think of an image, you can think of like a bow tie. You have a big, you have two triangles facing each other, and the center is Christ. All of the words prior to Christ are pointing to him. Right? All of the promises of God find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. Right? So that's why they like it specifically mentions that he fulfills all the Old Testament prophecies. Right? Um, because the thing that they're putting faith in is actually, they may not have known that his name was going to be Jesus until that was prophesied, or what he was going to look like, or what exactly he was going to do, but they trusted in the promise of the Messiah from God. And their faith in Jesus, that Messiah is what saves them. Just like it does you, because have you met Jesus in person? Not in person. I haven't either. Right? <laughs> so, it's my faith in the promises of God about Jesus, which then you could say, like I have seen him, we just saw him this morning, right? um, and, and ate him. Right? Uh, you, could, you could go that route. But like really, it's the same, the faith in the promises of God before and after saved in the exact same way. Faith in Jesus one, and the promises associated. Just one other question. Yeah. But, like the world that we know all encompassing and like everything that happened here in this small little part of the world and then the word was spread how it was spread but there were people who lived their whole lives never heard anything of god you sure. know what i mean so yeah i just i don't understand so your your question is essentially like what just, happens what happened to the people who lived in alaska before example, jesus yeah. came about or what we now call alaska and they never had an opportunity to hear the gospel I have no idea. <laughs> I know, right? Um, they don't. They don't say. The Bible doesn't tell us. So um, I, what I'm, I guess my whole point is, like God's plan of salvation could be different for everyone, right? Couldn't it be? So, if you want to say that God is not bound by the way that He set things up for us now, then. We could say that that's possible. I mean, God's involved, so anything's possible. We can't say anything specific about that. So the best answer in that case is the one that I gave, which is I don't know. Right? But well, I always kind of I've had a couple people ask me questions about that, and I always follow it up with two questions. One is, do you trust God? Yes. Then they're taken care of, however He chose to do it, um, and in whatever manner that means, which I can't say. And two, would you knowing make a difference? No. <laughs> right. So, and I, and I say that not to be snarky, but I think a lot of people have genuine consternation about that. And their consternation is usually like, well, if only we knew, then what? Like, it wouldn't have made a difference. Like, there's one question in my head always comes around, well, like, why did Jesus have to die? Like, why did he have to die? Like, why? But then, I mean, I kind of, like, fill it out with if he didn't die and it wasn't all this then the words wouldn't have been written down and it wouldn't have passed through everything so like i just sometimes just wonder that like you know he, he lived this awesome life why is why did he have to die sure so this is kind of what we're getting at today right why did jesus have to die so jesus had to die because sin is a serious thing right and sin meant Either all of us are dead forever, or Jesus dies. And so, because God loves you, he chose Jesus dying over you dying, knowing that he could overcome death 
and that we would overcome it as well. So a lot of times what people like to do is they like to say, well, Jesus comes in the picture and the gospel came about, the law is gone. That is not true. The law is still real and still good and still applies. What changed is that we're no longer condemned by the law. Because even though you and I, we don't keep the law perfectly, right? Jesus did, and his righteousness is now your righteousness and mine. Right? So, like one of the reasons that the, the church has historically worn white robes is to illustrate that fact. That like this is to demonstrate that I am the sinner just like everybody else. The only thing that I'm speaking from that's pure is God's word. And then when I wear the robe, it's signifying an imagery of I'm robed in the righteousness of Christ. It's not my own righteousness. It actually covers up my sin. Right? Uh, and it's getting at that reality that Jesus had to die because the price for sin had to be paid. Because God is not only loving, but he's also just. So there was this unresolved pain in the universe, if you want to say it that way, because of sin. Does that help? Yeah. On top of that, um, <clears throat> you read through the Old Testament, and blood is the essence of life. Sin is the essence of death. And there are numerous um, examples of giving a blood sacrifice to atone for sins. Um, and then there was also uh, the, the plague in, in Egypt where they put blood on or the lamb on the door, which kept them from death. Jesus was all called the lamb of God for a very specific reason, because his blood sacrifice took on all of the sin. And, and because death did not have a hold over him, it was the last sacrifice needed. Yeah, if Jesus hadn't come along, my job would be very different. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and this is what I meant earlier when I said that, like, in the Western world and in Christendom, because, because of Jesus and we're so far removed from that stuff, we like to think of our faith as like this clean, like, not visceral, gritty sort of thing, but it is. Right? Um, that's why they were in the sacrifice in the Old Testament. That's why Jesus had to die. Because there was a legitimate price that needed to be paid, that must be paid in order for justice, for things to be set right. So if Jesus came and, and, and fulfilled the law perfectly and didn't die, then we are not redeemed. Because we still bear the price for our own sin. And the price, the wages, the price of sin is death. So Jesus had to die according to the Father's plan, because that wage needed to be paid, otherwise we would be, you, know, you had any? You had something to say, Sandra? Well, yeah, like getting back to the, um, you know, his Jim's question about the yeah. people who didn't know anything about it. I mean, even like in, in our time, there are places, remote places, where people don't know anything about gone at all maybe not sure. that much right now but even like 30 years ago 40 years ago you know and i just remember learning in a bible study one time that like god's creation speaks for itself too yeah. and like you know by his creation that something created it or yeah. you know and and that would be jesus you know the word yeah so i mean you and this is where we get into the territory of like that's very complicated for us to fathom because there's so many aspects to it. Like, is this tribe of people in this remote place have they not heard about Jesus because they haven't had the opportunity, or because 30 years ago the leader of their tribe rejected the opportunity and now their blood is on his head, mm -hmm. right? Or is it well, that it's been forgotten? Or never had the opportunity. What? I was thinking people who never had that opportunity. Well, but that's the question, right? Are there actually any left? I don't know. Right, and, and so like, you know, and what, you know, what degree? Because there are there are passages in the scriptures that talk about that if you sort of take responsibility to make decisions for other people that are against yeah, God, right. then He's going to hold you accountable for that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so like, that's why I'm very concerned with the faithful practice of, of the sacraments. Because in our understanding is that those who are in the office of ministry 
are held accountable for the way those things are done. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and now I see what you're saying. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. thinking of that. Before. But but you're also true in that the Bible does also mention a couple of places that there are, people are without excuse yeah. because the creation attests to the glory of God. Right now. Yeah, that's the scripture that was brought up. Yes. And now, but then the question is, like, they're not necessarily going to know the confession that we confess at the Apostles' Creed with all the specifics about Jesus, because that's not revealed by creation, which is why we have the scriptures, right? right? We have natural revelation, which comes through creation and natural law and the way things have been designed, but you also have special revelation, which is the scriptures, which you can't come to just from thinking and observing, right? Um but that's again where we get into an area of the unknown aspect of God. We don't know exactly how he deals with those things. So one of the theories is like in, in the Chronicles of Narnia, if you've read that, there's a uh, a person who lives in a different nation and follows another god named Tash. Tash, I think his name is. And Lewis has this character in Paradise at the end. And so people will say that you know, it could be that he was like, giving a slight nod to universalism, I think that seems inconsistent with the other stuff that he says. I think it's more that he's making the point that the Holy Spirit is not bound by the constraints we're bound by as the church. So he's just not ruling out that if somebody's worshiping God, maybe they know him by a different name, but they're worshiping him in consistence with the scriptures, who knows what the Holy Spirit's going to do with that. But we don't go into that too particularly because it's very dangerous for us to do so. We're meant to do things the way God reveals it to us in his word, which is why I ask the question, if you knew, would it make a difference, right? In other words, is it your place to have any effect to the answer to that question, which is no, right? Um, and so then you get back to the really unsatisfying, at least from the human perspective, the answer that Job gets, which is, I'm God. And you're not going right. <laughs> right. um, And at some point, as a creature, you have to wrestle with that reality and it manifests itself in these sorts of questions where something is beyond your understanding or control or knowledge. And at the end of the day, you're going to have to say, I just trust that God knows what he's doing. You know, I don't know the answer to that question. I appreciate it. Just yeah, no, that's a great, I, that's a great question. Of stupid questions will pop up. No, that's not a stupid <laughs> question at all. The fact that it, it is unanswerable means it's not a dumb question. It's just like, I wish I could help you more, but I can't. Um, it shows okay. your limitations as men. <laughs> yeah, and, and one theory is that that's a, a sign, that's an opportunity to view it as an opportunity for like an act of perfect obedience. Right? Why do I believe that murder is wrong? Well, I also kind of think and agree with that, right? Like, well, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that murdering people is a bad thing to do. It's when I don't understand why God is asking me to do something that I'm fully stepping out of my own will and just obeying his. And then that's what's being asked of us with those sorts of questions is acknowledging it's beyond me, nor am I meant to know. He knows I'm going to trust him. So, all right. That's all the time we've got. So we'll start with part two next week and we're going to answer we're going to get to i'll make sure that we get to the stuff about death that people ask because i want those were there were like three people that asked about that so i wanted to make sure we hit that before some of the so. Pastor, is that suggestion? you were talking about how like next week will be our last day for, for uh, bible study would it be more prudent to make the end of the apostles creed the last time for bible study that was something i was going to discuss with people next week to see what they talk about so. All right, let's close with a word of prayer, and then you're free to go. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the wondrous plan of salvation that you planned and carried out from the beginning, even, with Jesus. We know that in Genesis chapter 3, right after the fall, you already were promising a Savior, and that Savior was your son, Jesus, who was true God and true man, so that he could do what we could not and perfectly obey your law, and offer his life as a sacrifice for our salvation and redemption. We give you thanks, Lord, for we know that we were undeserving of such a gift, and yet we have it. We give you thanks, and we ask your blessing and guidance as you send us out, 
so that we can share that wondrous message and gift with others who desperately need to hear. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.